well people. So, is there a password or something to What's that? How many how many have been to the F sharp SIG meeting at least once before? I recognize you, you, and you. Yeah, you were at the guy that said, though, we talked about that. How many have seen the give yeah, a presentation about that charge at the regular dot net? That's on um, three. No, okay. Well, this is cool. So we have a bunch of. Mm. How many of you um, are actually doing programming that show? Yeah. How many of you are F sharp curious? Yeah. We're not building it, are we? <laughs> yeah. Can I say things? Uh, and that's W. That way. Well, we have the uh, we have the editing software up there. <laughs> yeah. Point it up. Twice things in too. <laughs> and I'm gonna get the pizza. Probably rude to eat on the end. Put a laptop in there. Don't worry about getting all the nine TV for. So you want me to sit here and you're gonna film me? Here's a better one. Okay, I'm not saying that. Let me know what you do about that. Hopefully, it should be a long Oh, yeah, you're not. Okay. Okay, so what are we going to do with this after we've filmed it? Um, I don't know. We don't know yet. <laughs> Figure it out. Set music maybe or <laughs> the game name style after. It'll be up on YouTube. Bye bye. Well, it's going to be a Nazi uniform like Paul Rowe. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Um, since I'm going to continue eating a little pizza when I'm starving, also as long as I haven't talked all day, I'm going to ask everyone to give a quick little friendly introduction about who you are. I'll go first. I'm Richard Broida from uh, Ben Adelson, uh, from Cleveland Heights, Ohio, uh, principal consultant for uh, Bennett. I've uh, been doing that chart now for a couple of years uh, when I can. Uh, part of my mission is to install the virtues of F sharp to everyone who has an ear to listen and uh, convince everyone I can that F sharp is the language you ought to be programming in. If you're going to do any programming anymore. Um, I also do regular .NET programming, the object-oriented kind, and I do this talk, and I do the server, and just stuff like that. Um, I have a, uh, this meeting has uh, two chairs. I'm one, the other is a guy named Mike Palanga, who couldn't make it tonight. He had a personal family matter pop up on him yesterday. Um, sorry about that. He is probably going to be alternating with me in terms of reading the meetings. So this meeting, I'll, I'll mention this too, the meeting uh, was started actually uh, in 2010, I believe, and went more or less for monthly for uh, maybe around a year. Kind of petered out early last year. Our attendance dropped, our uh, you know, uh, work in Personal things started encroaching on me and Mike, and it just kind of lost lost the air, so to speak. Um, but I wanted to reboot it because uh, despite despite all of that, F sharp itself is marching along and going very strong. And I think it's, uh, it's more interesting and more more important all along. To uh, I think it's, it's, it's 
stock is rising, or it's uh, the tide is rising, or the moon is rising, and it's uh, not a bad idea to, uh, to get to get aware, at least become aware of it, and to think about what could I do um, if I were using this instead of the .NET language that I use instead. Um, I'm assuming that everyone here is a .NET programmer. I probably shouldn't assume that. Anyone here not a .NET programmer? Okay. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let you tell us in a minute what, what you expect. Um, so this meeting is sort of a reboot of the, of the SIG. We are going to have a, a monthly meeting uh, going forward for as long as we can stand it. Um, and I hope that as many of you as find some benefit out of it, I hope you all find some benefit out of this. Um, and uh, we'll think about coming back. Uh, we'll probably be doing it uh, to try to keep it on a regular schedule of uh, third or fourth Thursday night of the month in this room or another room like it in this uh, building complex. Okay? So, um, I'd like to uh, uh, invite you to uh, introduce yourselves to the group, uh, just, just a little bit about who you are, and, and please tell me why, what, what, what motivated you to show up tonight, and uh, what do you hope to get out of tonight, and, and, and ongoing situation in this group if you decide to come back. And I'll start here. Hey, my name is Tim Chikalis. I'm a second program second in the group of the students. And I started when we started the point 10 because the language that sounded very interesting and it was just interesting to get into it. I'm about to get practice. Okay. Cool. And, and, and where are you? Where, where, where do you uh, fly your plane? Where do you program in Angular? Oh, uh, actually, the phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Ryan Roberts. I'm an actual software tester. I'm a financial tester. So, my question is talking about. I do have some developing background in the open I'm sorry, what was your name? Ethan. Yeah. Um, my co-worker, Brian. I'm just not sure. Um, he actually is in the first place. Which one is that? Okay, you guys I know, but I'm very good at all. Technical piece this, and I just heard that even at the Microsoft MVP Summit, which I wasn't at, uh, they were in the of you uh, have done Now, first I'm going to try to get my video, and then I'm going to try to get on the internet.
Okay. Yeah. There for a moment. It's a totally different resolution on the screen than it is on my laptop. So, uh, a little playing around with it. Uh, All right. Maybe my laptop is taking time with me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, when, I, when we're done, I'll put the slide deck up on our uh, Open Events website uh, to be there by Monday at the latest. And, and then the slide, if you want, write them down. Just kidding. There's not going to be a lot of slides. It's going to be talk and demo and stuff. Um, so here's the info about me, and here's our agenda. Uh, we'll see how much. Uh, we ought to talk a little bit about how late we're going to go. It's now 10 after 6. I was planning to go till planning to go till 7:30. Uh, presentations, I, big presentations that I give almost always run over time until uh, they throw us out of the room. They are going to throw us out at about. Oh, I think about it, maybe, maybe 48, something like that. Uh, so. We'll, we'll be able, if you have to leave earlier than that, I understand. Uh, we'll put it up. Uh, and, uh, so I'm going to try to cover the questions of, of, of the first is just the relationship of functional programming with testing. Um, one of the common things you hear people say as a reason why you ought to do functional programming and therefore why you, why you ought to use a language like F sharp, which is designed for functional programming, is that it will reduce the need for testing. Because it will just work better. And I want to have some discussion about that. You know, to what extent might that be true? And uh, that's going to require a little bit of discussion about what is functional programming. So for some of you who are brand new to F sharp or brand new to functional programming, uh, this will not by any means be a complete Explanation of F sharp or, or functional programming, but I'll, I'll hit on you know, a lot of key points that, that you know, you've heard already or, or it's good to hear again. Then we'll get into some examples and we'll talk about uh, various approaches to testing, starting with just testing on what I call testing on the fly, where you just write tests yourself, no, no library, no framework, just, just write some code and test it yourself. And then we'll get into starting to look at, at using different Unit testing and, and uh, behavior driven testing frameworks with F sharp. Um, so one of the one of the two I, I have two three messages I want I want to I want you to leave with. Three messages I want to give you and hopefully can can persuade you of. And they are that number one, yes indeed, F sharp code does need less testing if you write in a strictly functional style. Number two is that said. All the standard approaches to testing that you've probably learned already, to the extent you've learned any already, that you've learned with object oriented languages like Java or GP, will work with F sharp and will work just fine with F sharp. So there's no impediment to using them just because you're programming with F sharp. And the third is that in some ways F sharp actually is a very good language to use for testing, even if you're going to test code that is not written in F sharp. So it makes sense, and there are organizations today that are using F sharp as their testing language, even though they don't use it for their production language. 
Okay, we're going to look at, in the course of this, I'm going to at least show you an introduction, at an introductory level, three different F sharp specific unit testing libraries. Uh, one is called FS Unit, which is an add on to your, your favorite flavor of unit testing framework. Uh, the next one is called PickSpec, which is a behavior driven design um, framework library, uh, which is very similar to SpecFlow. And the third one is called Folk. That's how I'm going to pronounce it. It's been suggested that it could be pronounced other ways. Uh, but Folk is a, is a mocking library similar to Mock, or Mock U, so sometimes pronounce that one. Uh, it's basically a very similar thing with in, in the C chart. I will not, because of the time constraints we're under and because of the level of expertise that we all have in this room, I'm not going to go into total, thorough, vacuum cleaner detail on all things about everything. But this is a great place, I think, to start learning about f sharp if you're new. And it's a good place to try to look for connections between what you can do in f sharp and what you can do in other languages uh, in the .NET environment. So, um, yeah. Just a quick question about why why do we test code? Well, we test code really for two reasons. And I, I put this slide in here because I want to emphasize one of the strong points about uh, really all three, well, two of the three uh, f -sharp libraries that we're going to look at. You use testing primarily just to show that your code works. It does what it's supposed to do. In the course of doing that, you are inevitably going to be involved in the task of defining what it is that the code is supposed to do. If you follow, how many of you are, how many of you are acquainted with Agile, some version or other of Agile development? So, almost every version of Agile development, whether it's stream programming or, or Scrum or Microsoft, whatever they call theirs, uh, they all emphasize the idea of testing first. Write tests, then write the code that you're testing. So every, every test fails when you first write it, and if it's in a statically typed language like C sharp, that means the first thing that happens is the test doesn't compile, because you're talking about some class or some, some future class that doesn't exist yet. Okay, so first, first it doesn't compile, then it compiles, it, does, it runs and fails, then it runs and succeeds. Go like this, and as you go, you your test to find what the behavior is that you create. How many of you who are, uh, uh, I'm, I'm curious, first of all, for you testing guys, is that how things work uh, in your environment at the insurance company, or do they give you code and say, here, write some tests for this? Uh, basically, what they talk about at the development and writing two tests. Um, but that doesn't actually happen. And you test it the test 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 the um, we do it sometimes with uh, projects I'm, I'm on at Ben Reopen. Uh, well, certain things don't lend themselves to being tested very well, like this talk. I mean, it's not easy to, to, to find this talk to a unit at a unit test, um, which we thought it was a server. Likewise, if you do all your work with SQL Server, you know, unit testing with SQL Server is kind of a, a nice phrase, but you know, it's what you can do. That um, but anyway, the, it's still a good idea to write tests as opposed to not writing tests. And then the other advantage that testing has, uh, or benefit that it can give you, is it gives you a nice way to document what the code is supposed to do. Um, and I'm going to emphasize this particularly for everyone who is new to F-Sharp or is still feeling kind of like, a, like an apprentice at F-Sharp, 
one of the drawbacks, so you, F sharp is a different language. It's a profoundly different language than C sharp and DB.net. Um, well, I'll explain a little bit about the history of F sharp before I even get into that. It's a different kind of language, and one of the distinguishing things about it is that its syntax is very terse. Very, very, uh, much less verbose, much less wordy than C sharp is. You might, you know, you might think that C sharp is not a very wordy language because it has curly braces instead of beginning and end. Beginning and end. Um, you know, compared to Visual Basic, it is less wordy. But compared to F sharp, it's like one piece. Um, so one of the drawbacks is you can write F sharp code that can be a little hard to figure out after you've written it. You don't want it to be like Perl. You don't want to feel like it's a write only language. So testing gives you a very nice way to document, you know, both demonstrate and document in a much more in a readable fashion what it is that the code you've written is supposed to be doing and why. And you'll see that right away when you get into uh, the example. Okay, so maybe this is a good time to talk about some of the distinctive things about functional programming that makes it different. The, uh, who, 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 who knows what the first functional programming language was? Not you. Somebody other than Jim, tell us what the first functional programming language was. Well, he said, list. How many of you have programmed in list? Right? You got to Scheme. Okay, so there's a whole family of languages that derive from list. There's Scheme, there's, uh, there's uh, Closure, there's one called Racket that I'm actually learning now. Um, so Lisp is generally considered first with the functional programming language. Um, F sharp, it'd be nice to say that F sharp is derived from Lisp, but it's not. It's derived from a language called ML. How many of you have heard of ML before? ML is a language that was invented about the same time as Pascal. And, uh, I'm sorry. And then a little, its origins go back to the, to the 70s. The first, I think, official, officially blessed uh, release version of it came out in 85. Mid 80s. So it's about as old as, uh, as uh, I think small talk, small talk of uh, It's been around. It was originally not an object-oriented language. It was originally not, I was a .NET language, it was, uh, uh, but it was not an interpreted language either. It was a, a compiled um, language. Anyway, the, the syntax, as ML is still alive today. It's now called standard ML or SML. You can still, you can get it free off the internet. And, uh, um, Use uh, Emacs or uh, Sublime Text or some other open source editor. They all have uh, standard ML plugins that will, that will edit SML code. Um, that's the, the basic backbone of the F sharp language. Then another language came after that called OCaml. Or object, well, first there was a language called Camel, then one was called Objective Camel or OCaml, which you mentioned when they teach you that at Harvard. Uh, the syntax of F sharp is really very similar to the syntax of OCaml. So learning F sharp syntax is, is pretty good segue into OCaml. But it isn't that hard to learn SML either. Actually, learn F sharp for a while. Um, so F sharp's in this odd position that it's derived from a non-object-oriented functional language, um, or from a lineage of non-object-oriented functional languages. And yet it is, it runs in .NET. So it has support built into it for object-oriented programming as well as for non-object-oriented or functional programming. And also for plain old, what we functionally call procedural programming, or imperative programming. Um, so you can program it, they say, in all three idioms with that chart. I'm only going to be talking about using the functional idioms in that chart, which is a very good built in support for it that we drive from a uh, history of functional language. So one of the key things in a functional language when you program in functional manner is the use of immutable types. 
Immutable just means it never changes. Okay. And strictly speaking, in, in, in correct terminology, when you program an F-sharp, when you create objects, and I do call them objects in F-sharp, but I don't call them the, the, uh, the little symbol that you'll declare in F-sharp to, uh, to indicate your object is called a, an identifier. It's not a variable. And we try to not use the word variable when we're dealing with F-sharp because variable is what? Not mutable. It can vary. A mutable thing is something you just identify. Um, another distinguishing thing about functional programming is that in functional programming, all functions are first class types, meaning that a function can be passed as an argument into another function. A function can be returned as a return value from another function. Um, a function signature can be, you know, the signature of a function, what it takes as an input, can be simply the signature of a function, and any function that complies to that signature can be passed in as, uh, as the argument. Now you can do, ever since uh, C sharp, uh, C sharp 3.0, I believe, is uh, what I want to say. C sharp 3.0 has had something similar. There's, uh, I don't even have ever seen the funk side in C sharp or the action type. Yeah, the action type in C sharp. Those are actually delegates. They're, they're definitely the delegates, but they, they're, they're parameterized uh, with generic parameters so you can specify at one, at, when you declare one of these what the input arguments are and what the return type is. It's a uh, and there is no return type, but it's an action type. Right? So you can, do, you can do a lot of things like this in, um, in C sharp, but uh, it's not as easy as convenient as it is in that sharp. Okay, finally, um, the last thing I want to mention is the F sharp library. F sharp has its own uh, library assembly that gets installed automatically whenever you create an F sharp project into the studio. And it's got lots of reusable uh, library routines in it that are waiting for you to exploit in your own programs. You should use them. Uh, I'll give you some simple examples. Uh, I, I'll try to anyway a little bit um, so you get an idea of what I mean. But like any good library, you want to use, uh, you know, it's, it's tested, it's very well, its behavior is well defined, it's not that hard to learn how to use, and it'll work. So if your logic of your code is relying on any of the functionality that's found in these libraries, you, you know, that, that's something you probably won't have to go in test very rigorously um, to make sure it's behaving. Okay. Um, I'm going to come back to this slide. I'm, I'm getting ready to exit over to the studio, but I'll, I'll bring this up right now. So I'm going to be showing you how to uh, use three different libraries in the F-Drop project. I'm just give you an introduction to it. And uh, these are the, the URLs where you can find the, the, the uh, Website, they're, they're repositories, they're all open source. The first one is on GitHub, the next two are on CodeFlex. Um, you can download all the source code yourself, and I have done so, and I have it loaded in Google Studio right now, and we take a few quick looks to teach that here and there. It's very instructive and educational, um, although they're, they're kind of advanced. They're not necessarily, uh, might be a little intimidating to go through the source code if you're just beginning. But, uh, you can, you can look inside to your heart's content and see how they work uh, and, and also modify them and extend or change anything about them uh, feel free. And they're all under passive licenses. Okay, so I'm going to put the slides now. So since we're all new, I had a, 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 a couple sample projects that I started on, but I think I'm going to just ditch those and start all over again. So you guys can get the whole story from the <coughs> Okay, so I'm gonna let's see, I have a uh, I have a folder 
we'll start off for tonight's SIG. And then we'll uh, talk live. Oh, my, I'm going to create a new project called Live Demo for a new solution. Uh, I'm sorry, that was just a, a blank solution to that I always do. This, by the way, is Visual Studio 11. Um, everything that I'm going to, absolutely everything I'm about to show you can be done in, in any version of Visual Studio. One of the nice things, any version that you're likely to still have. I think we're in 2001. I think yes. F Sharp was originally introduced in Visual Studio 2005, and it still works in Visual Studio 2005. Um, it's pretty new, but uh, it goes back that far. And every single thing in F Sharp works. Uh, well, everything we're going to cover tonight, anyway, works in .NET 2.0 and higher. So you don't have to have uh, this is going to be on .NET 4.0, I believe, but it's going to fall. But, uh, there's nothing about it that wouldn't work in .NET 2.0 as well. Well, uh, I don't that was anyway, the point is, you, you don't have to have uh, you don't have to have Visual Studio 11. I'm going to try and save this as a 2010 project site. Anyway. F Sharp comes with Visual Studio, with all versions of Visual Studio, starting with 2010 and continuing with 2012. So if you have Visual Studio, you've got F Sharp. You may not have installed it, um, because one of your choices is you don't do a full installation, you can choose not to have F Sharp. But if you just click and say, yeah, install everything, which is what people are going to do, um, it'll be there. You know, use it, but it'll be there. So let's create us, uh, you know, we, we have this, the same two basic kinds of projects uh, in F-Sharp that you have in all the other languages. You have an F-Sharp application, which is going to be an EXE uh, console app, what that will do. Or you can have an F-Sharp library, which will be an assembly that just has uh, code inside and form a class. Okay. I'm going to make a library. And... Uh, All right, so the, um, the project template created a class library for me. Um, it added uh, one one and only one F sharp specific uh, reference, which is F sharp dot four, where all of these web sharp libraries I was talking about are located. The rest is just normal. One of the things I like actually about F sharp is that unlike a C sharp project, there aren't a dozen more assemblies here that I'm never going to use. It doesn't have system data, it doesn't have system XML, and you know, if I want those, I know how to add them. So I kind of, kind of like that it put part of you up with. Uh, Extra things. And then it creates two files for us. Um, the first one is called library1.fs, which is your F sharp file extension. And the other one is called scriptfsx. And this is uh, a, a way that you can uh, write unit tests for your library code. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate how you might do that. Um, that's that. I think I'll just for now ignore the script file and just do the library. Okay, now. First thing you notice about F sharp, if you've never seen it before, is that there are no semicolons. Actually, there are semicolons, but they're not used the way they are in C sharp or your other favorite semicolon going in language. So for what we're doing right here, we don't need semicolons. Um, we also don't need curly braces. Uh, again, curly braces are used in F sharp, but they aren't used for what you're used to. So for now, just sort of get used to them not being semicolons either, or uh, curly braces either. 
What we have here is a definition of a class. Okay, this is what a class definition in C sharp. Uh, this is what a class, a class that you might define in C sharp looks like when you define it in F sharp. Um, the first important thing, well, first, first notice that there's a namespace being declared up at the top, and that means the same thing that it would mean in DB or C sharp. Create a document namespace starting here. Um, the usual rules about namespaces apply to these. And then we're declaring a type, and this particular type is going to be a, a .NET class. Okay? You can tell it's a .NET class because the name of it is followed immediately by parentheses. That represents the class's constructor. This class has a default constructor, so there's nothing inside those parentheses. And then equals. Now, equals in in uh, in F sharp is never an assignment state. The equals symbol in F sharp never means an assignment state. What it always means is that it is a definition state. When you put something after an equal sign, it means this is going to be the definition of whatever it was on the left hand side. And what we're defining is this thing here as a member of the class we're calling class one. The member is called X and its value is string XR. Okay. Now, let's try this out. I'm going to do a little magic keystroke here. Okay. That opens up a special window in Visual Studio. This is called the F, this is called the F Sharp Interactive Window. If you've dealt much with other functional languages, if you've ever done any list type work, or if you've ever worked with, uh, with what, I think Python has this. Uh, you may have heard the term REPL, R-E-P-L. It stands for something. Run. Thank you. Read something. No. Read, read, evaluate, print. Read, evaluate, and print. It's called a REPL. That's what this is. In our REPL, this is a little interactive window where we it's, it's not unlike the immediate window in uh, when you're debugging in Visual Studio. That's the closest comparison I can make to it. Um, I can write F sharp expressions in my REPL. So I can write something like 4 plus 5. Now, in the REPL only, the immediate window only, every time I want to finish an expression, I have to put two semicolons. The two semicolons are not part of the F sharp language. I'm not going to be needing them up in my code that I have in the editor up above. I only need them in the immediate window so that the immediate window knows that I've finished writing an expression. Remember, there are no semicolons in the language. And the curly braces in the language, so this is a, a, a cheating way of telling uh, the uh, interactive window that I'm done. Okay, my expression is finished. All right, similarly, I can take the code up here that I wrote, all of this, and I can highlight it and I can hit um, the work button. I can hit, uh, The default keystroke, I believe, is Alt-Enter. I've changed it because Alt-Enter is a uh, very popular keystroke shortcut in, uh, in, uh, in ReSharper. Yeah, I have ReSharper in Visual Studio here. And ReSharper wants Alt-Enter all to itself. So I, I do map the keyboard to Alt-Symbol alt quote. Anyway, what that'll do is it'll read whatever you highlighted in the, in the code editing window, and it'll copy it down into the immediate window, and then it'll execute. Evaluate. Yeah. All right, so uh, and it's telling me that I have a type called class one, and then it throws a little extra notation on here saying that that type I've defined is indeed a class. And uh, it has a, now this is interesting, this is the definition of a constructor, okay? 
when you work in that sharp, you want to get used to this notation. This is defining the signature of a method, or actually the signature of a function. The function, the first thing we see here is the input argument to that function, which is called unit, because the parentheses are empty. We don't pass anything in. F sharp has a special name for nothing passed in. It's called unit. Okay? Unit is a type. Unit in, you know, nothing is, you know, zero wasn't a number until, uh, oh, what, 2,000 years ago, and the Hindus decided zero was a number. In C sharp, void is not a type. Void is not a thing. Void is nothing. In F sharp, void is an object. Void is a thing. Void is a it belongs to type unit. Okay. This is telling us that our first argument, our first input to the function is unit. This arrow here is leading us to the next. And then whatever comes at the end, to the far right of this expression, is what we're going to get back in return. And what we're getting back in return is an object of type class 1. Okay. So this is telling us a function that takes no input and returns to class 1, which is precisely what the default constructor does. Okay. And to help clear up any confusion we might have, it's got the keyword new here. So that that's, that's, this, is, this is indeed the constructor. Then we have the member X, which uh, was defined here. Notice that this thing was dropped out. This, this means pretty much the same thing as it would mean in C sharp. I mean, it's a member that belongs to, um, to this truly. And uh, so we have member X, and it's defined as a simply a string. Okay? No, no arrow. This is not technically a function. It's just a, uh, a value. All right. Now that we have uh, this class defined, we can create an instance of it, and we do that with the wonderful F# -sharp keyword called let. All right, so we'll have a, we'll create an identifier called myob, myob equals new last one. And you like that. No, it's all right. All right. Okay, so now it says here val, V-A-L, not V-A-R, V-A-L, uh, my object is an instance of class 1. Now that I know I have an instance of class 1, I should be able to access its, uh, its uh, X property, its X member. All right, and it did. Now, here's what I was going to tell you about immutability. Suppose I try to change X. Okay. Error. Um, let's try that. Let's see. The diary of the expression. So it asked, it interpreted the equal sign as, are you the same? And if it came back with it, no. If I think just this, and sharp, and it came like that, that's true. Okay, what if I try to change it? This is the um, this is this arrow pointing left with an equal sign on it is the uh, called the destructive assignment operator. I like to call it that. And uh, hmm, Oh, yeah, because that was greater than equal. 
There we go. Property X cannot be set. Don't do that. Property X cannot be set. Now, if I want to, I can make this mutable. It is immutable by all members that I declare like this in the class, but immutable by default. If I want to, there's a special keyword I can use called mutable that will make it mutable, but I don't want to. Because back to my point about testing. As long as the members of objects are immutable, then you don't have to test whether or not they got changed. If the logic of your program doesn't depend on things, you know, the state of an object changing from the time you created it, then you don't need to test what the state of an object is as you're using it. You just create it once and you can assume without even having to test it that from then on it's going to have the same state that it had when you created it. At most, you might want to test what the state is at the very beginning in case something you know, derived and some calculating happened inside the class. Um, that, uh, what you want to check on. Okay? So this is simply now this is simply what, what, what we what we can do if we're using normal .NET classes. An even better way to go in F sharp is you can, and generally speaking you can, as long as all the code you're writing is in F sharp, as long as your project is self-contained in F sharp, you can use all the techniques I'm going to be showing you next to your heart's content. If you need your F sharp project to interoperate with non F sharp code, which is something that all about that class libraries should be able to do, you may want you may have to avoid some of the things I'm going to show you next, uh, because they're not going to play nice with non with non functional language. Let's uh, let's try uh, doing a different kind of type. And again, I'm just doing this from memory, so if my syntax uh, fails me, uh, apologize me, we just want this to help. Um, let's see. Not sure. Uh, not sure if I need those curly braces. Okay. Now, now we're now we're leaving object-oriented programming behind, and we're going over to the functional side of the fence. This is a type of this is a, this is a sort of type that we can create. <clears throat> this uh, syntax and this concept come directly out of ML. Okay. Uh, a nice fancy word for what I just did is this is this is this is known as an algebraic data type. <laughs> algebraic data type. Um, the term that's actually used in the F sharp language uh, specification is this is called a discriminated union. Okay. Uh, what the heck am I talking about? Let's, uh, let's try and create something here. 
Um, let ex1 equal n. Okay, is like that. Let ex2 equal multiply. Like that. Let ex3 equal const 3. And that be that too. Okay. So what have we done? We've got a type of EXPR, which stands for expression. And type can be one of three different things. It can either be add, it can be multiply, or it can be const. If it's going to be const, it takes an additional argument, if you will, of all the parameters, all the, I'm not sure if it's correct, it's sort of like an argument to a function, or it's sort of like a value that you might assign to a variable. I'm just saying that if I'm going to be a const, I need to have an, in, an integer to go with me. Okay? Let's expand the definition a little bit and you can get what, uh, what you really need. I'm going to create one more variety here. And these, these alternatives are all being expressed with a vertical pipe. That's the character on the keyboard right below the backspace key, right over the backslash. Okay, the vertical pipe. And we're going to call this one uh, uh, a uh, binary. You know what? Let's, let's, let's not. Let's two of these. All right. This first one's going to represent arithmetic operators. The second one is going to be expression. So we call this uh, expression like this. Um, and this will either be a constant or else it will be a uh, complex we'll call it of an operation And an expression, and another expression. All right. So <laughs> I've just redefined what the what my expression type is, and I've created another type here. So where I'm going with this is I'm trying to create a little um, a little uh, language interpreter, which is a very common functional programming uh, beginners exercise. Uh, notice that it's recursive in the sense that the, comp the complex uh, variety of an expression is a combination of an operation and two other expressions. Okay. Change the name of it. Call it a binary op. Meaning that the uh, we need two expressions and an operator. It could be either add or multiply. Okay. Okay. Now that we have that, we can create a function. This will be the first function we've seen. And what this is going to do is it's going to evaluate uh, expressions. So 
Okay. Again, I'm using the let keyword. Let is used in F sharp for defining values, and it's also used for defining functions. Okay. So the name of my function is eval, and it has one argument called expression. Or exp, sorry. Notice that there are no parentheses there. I don't, in this case, don't have to have a parentheses if I don't want to. And I haven't said what expression, what type of a thing expression is. Nor have I said on that first line what, if anything, this function is going to return. Okay? But I don't need to. Why? I'm going to use a technique called pattern map. Okay? And I have a vertical bar here again, but don't confuse that with the vertical bar I had above. Um, Okay, if it's going to be a multiply, then I need, um, oh, you know what? No, that's not that's right. Okay. And it's name space is gonna contain value. Hmm. Okay. I'm gonna finesse my way past that issue. I can name space the module. Okay. Now the only thing, the only problem remaining is that it's not happy with me taking these two arguments, and adding them, and multiplying them because they're not, in fact, integers. They are. Uh, expressions. So we're going to do this. I added the keyword rec up the top. That makes this a recursive function. And now what we're going to do is say eval c1 times eval c2. Same thing here, except it's add instead of multiply. 
Yeah. So now, let's try evaluating some some expressions. Okay, so I'm going to eval. Um, Constant four, negative four. I'm going to eval, const, I'm going to eval, add, uh, this add, const, two, const four. No? So it took, it took um, two constants and added them. And I could nest this even more. Instead of constant three here, I could make this another binary op. And then in there I could put multiply, multiply, uh, I don't know, five and seven. Yeah. Sorry. Obviously, this is not a terribly convenient way to do math. Yeah. But the point is that once I've created this type, I don't really have to do a lot of testing with it. Because, for one thing, once I create anything of type, uh, of type, uh, it's EXPR. Once I create any, anything of type EXPR, I know that it, for as long as I have it around, it's not going to change. So none of the, uh, none of these different, uh, instances of it are subject to change by me. Um, Second thing is, I've used a recursive function here. All right? The recursive function is going to always stop when it reaches a case where the value that it's evaluating is a constant. So if it finds, if you've given it a constant, then it's just going to strip the integer value out and return that. Okay? If it's anything else, it's going to call itself, it's going to say, all right, multiply means multiply two expressions together. I should have called them E1 and E2 instead of C1 and C2. Right. So I'm going to take two expressions and I'm just going to evaluate each of them and I'm going to keep drilling down into them. If, if either one of these or both of these is not itself a constant, then I'm just going to keep following this over and over until until I get to something that is. And I know that I have to. Um, uh, yeah, because sooner or later, I've got to... Uh, let's see, I have to pick up that. Let's try this. Let's try a path lots of this. Uh, eval. Um, I think I'm going to I'm going to have to I'm going to I'm going to have to sooner or later provide a constant for each of the two arguments of uh, either multiply or add in order to create an expression object at all. Okay, so I don't have to worry about null. The other big point I want to make about this is that when you use these kinds of immutable data types that come with that chart, they can't be null. So you can't have null reference exceptions. And you don't have to try testing with null. You can't. Null is not a legal value for a type like this. Okay? And the other point I want to make about recursion is that although recur writing fun recursive functions is something that most of us have 
practiced a little bit in our, in our object-oriented language of choice, but most of us hardly ever do it, and often we're warned, either by the book we're reading, or by the blog post we're reading, or by the mentor who's mentoring us, that the person is dangerous, it leads to infinite regress, and it blows the stack, and crashes the machine, um, or it sits there and spins the CPU at 100% for hours and hours. Um, so don't do it. And also, it's hard. It's hard to understand. You know, you have to think backwards and so on and so forth. That's all somewhat true. But on the other hand, if you use recursiveness in your programming, you have to deal with all these problems in order for the function to work at all. Okay? You have to deal with how does it end? Uh, what is the, you know, what's at the end of the line? If I'm taking a big, you know, if I'm taking a big wad of stuff, maybe it's a, li a list of items, it's a, arranged in a serial order, or maybe it's a tree that's arranged in a hierarchy like this is, it has to come to an end somewhere. I have to know how to find where the end is, and I have to decide what I'm going to do when I reach the end. Okay? And then one other thing that I've sharp is very good about protecting you from is uh, accidentally uh, making uh, making mistakes with uh, pipe inconsistency. Now, let me see if I can make a real simple example right here. Let's say that I want to add another branch to this uh, uh, matching statement, and I want to say. Uh, Let's say, let's just let's suppose that expression gets passed in as, and, it's, and it's a string, okay? Let's see what I should do with a string. And in that case, I'll return uh, number 42, okay? All right. All right, big red squiggle right there, and uh, this will not compile. And there's our problem. This expression is expected to have type EXPR. Right here is a type string. Okay, strings don't belong in a match in a match statement that's expecting an, uh, an argument of type expression. Okay, so it won't let you pass an object of the wrong type into the uh, in, into this piece of code right here. And in fact, let's uh, if we go back and look at um, look at what the uh, what the immediate uh, what the uh, interactive window told us when we declared this. It says ef uh, eval is a function that takes an expression as an input argument and returns an end. Okay. Well, nowhere up here on the first line did I say what type this this argument is. It figured it out. Okay, it looked at what I'm doing with this thing inside the code that I wrote and says you can only do that with objects that are of type expression. That's the only type in the local namespace environment that I know about that could that could look like this in the pattern. And therefore um, that's what it must be. So it goes ahead and compiles. It, it is not doing dynamic typing things. Not like Python or Ruby or JavaScript, where it waits until the runtime to decide what the type of the argument is. It's deciding at compile time. But I didn't have to give it any help to, uh, to, to I didn't have to say explicitly what it was to figure it out what it was. And one more thing is that if I am forgetful and I, uh, Try to declare it like this, okay, leaving out one of the cases that the uh, expression type can be. Uh, it gives me a warning. Now I could turn warnings as errors on, and I could make that an error. But uh, even a warning is, is better than you're going to get in, in, a, in an object-oriented language. Says incomplete pattern matches on this expression. For example. Uh, the case of binary op add may indicate a case not covered by the pattern. Well, yeah, that's putting it very nicely. In fact, it's not at all covered by my pattern. Okay, let's put it back and I'll make that go away. 
So what does this do? This gives us a way for the compiler to tell us, and for this, if we set one of these people errors, from ignoring one of the cases that we should account for. Whereas if you write a case statement in C-Sharp or DB, it will cheerfully come along like nothing's wrong if you forget the case that you should have covered. All right? So for all these reasons, there's just less let less to test when you're doing um, when you're doing this kind of programming than you would if you're doing object oriented. Okay, now we go. Seven one. All right, so that's that's a quick tour of and this this again is just scratching the surface of, of, of what you can do with F sharp and how language works, but I wanna proceed to show you a little bit about testing. So Let's add a, an F sharp testing library. Oh, and now I need to go on. If I'm going to do that, do I have a planning to? I need to go on the internet. So, someone help me here. Is there a. Uh, do I connect automatically or do I have to. Oh, yeah. oh, I have a cable over here. That would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't have long expenses. I've been of a sick. <laughs> Do we have any, any questions, comments? No. That's up to Is it being used for any type of development in particular right now? Where it has grown the strongest uh, you know, market niche that I'm aware of at the moment, there, there are several. The one that's probably the most notable, and uh, notable in the sense that it's paying big bucks to programmers, is in financial uh, work. In, uh, you know, you know the, the, the crash of 2008 was all caused by evil software that was uh, uh, you know, programmed to do automatic trading in the markets. I don't know that's you know, people that write software that's, that's used in automated financial trading, in automated financial analysis, um, in big data crunching with business data, um, those kinds of things are using a variety of functional languages for that kind of programming. And F Sharp has become one of the popular ones. Um, the OCaml language that we talked about is another one that's used quite a bit. Uh, some, some of the some of the big software houses in London and New York are, are uh, some of them started out in no camel and moved to F sharp and others are still in no camel. So that's one area. Another area is is what is loosely called or is I think loosely called scientific unit uh, programming. There's some features in F sharp that make it especially nice for dealing with real numbers and floating point numbers. Um, and, and Crunch heavy kinds of numbers. Um, so it's used for that. There is, I think, a growing trend. And this is this is sort of you know, we, we're not Wall Street here in Cleveland, so. Um, but for day-to-day -day programming, you can use it too. Particularly if you're doing, uh, you know, I do a fair amount of, of uh, middle-tier programming. I, I write, uh, I, I program the WCF. Um, you know, I'm starting to do some stuff with RESTful uh, web services, um, and I use a lot of interacting with BizTalk, where when you do write code in BizTalk, it's, it's not using interface code. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, very, it's very functional. I mean, it's, it's, it's interface driven primarily. So anytime when you're just writing functions, you know, implementing interfaces and, and uh, either transforming data or uh, Gathering, gathering data uh, or making decisions, uh, you know, it's a very suitable language to use for, for those kinds of things. Now, the big, the big frontier is uh, user interface programming. Uh, and Microsoft always invests very heavily in user interface programming, and they have not been investing heavily in that shot user interface programming. So. You know, whether it's Windows Forms or it's WPF or it's uh, uh, the new 
uh, WinRT stuff for, for Windows 8, Windows Phone. Uh, those are not. The problem is that they don't they don't build support for the. They don't, you know, they, you have these add-in tools, these designers and things that generate code for you or that take code that you write behind in Visual Studio, and those don't come with built-in support for F Sharp for the most part. Um, there's a book that was just published recently on O'Reilly Press, and I met the guy who wrote it at CodeNash. Uh, his name's Daniel Mole, and I don't know the title of the book, but it has a, a hummingbird on the cover. And uh, it's about how to how to do everything with that stuff. How to write NPC web applications, how to write Azure cloud applications, and, uh, the whole gamut of stuff. Uh, or how to write database access code with it. So you can do an awful lot. Um, the question, really, the answer is if, well, if I'm going to work in a place where they're already using F Sharp, um, which is nowhere in Cleveland that I know of. Um, then great, let's, let's, let's sit down and start writing that chart. If there's a potential to use it because you have a brand new project and nobody cares what language it's in, then I would definitely consider using it. If it's adding on to a project that already is written in some other language, but it's a fairly self-contained or containable add-in, then you might consider writing that in that chart. If it's the tests that go with a non F sharp library that somebody needs to test them, you can consider writing the tests in. So and I've used it to write little knockoff utilities, and I'm just going to, you know, things to, to um, clean out uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of mailboxes and ancient exchange servers so they can migrate to Office 365. You know, and it was a knockoff. You know, we got we a program that's going to run for a day or two, uh, cleaning out thousands upon thousands of mailboxes, and then we're never going to run it again. But we're going to have fun. And nobody cares. Because, uh, you know, after it was done running, nobody it didn't matter if it was really good or not. Um, although it's been long, but uh, well, they're going to come looking for me anyway, so I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to go into it. Okay, so that's that's kind of where, I mean, I, other people could give you other answers. Um, the F Sharp people themselves in Microsoft are kind of careful for political reasons, I think, to not claim that it's the next C Sharp or that they ought to replace all the other languages. Um, they're they're very diplomatic about saying that it's 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 you know it's great for for a particular kind of an application. Um, those of us who don't work for Microsoft and who just like F Sharp um, can tend to be a little, a little more bold about it. Um, I follow a lot of people on Twitter who are, who are Microsoft MVPs, including most of the F Sharp MVPs. And uh, I, I found out on Twitter that a uh, number of sessions they had, at, they just had the Microsoft MVP Summit, who was not up invited. And uh, the F Sharp people were all sitting in the back of the room, snickering and irritating the C Sharp people because of the uh, how lame they thought the C Sharp code sample was. Uh, so I guess they're not always so diplomatic, but it's uh, <laughs> the, uh, the big guys. Are. Okay, um, let's see if I'm on the internet. <laughs> hey, look at that. What in the world is that? What? Climbing wall. The bird's out. I think the bird's out. Don't even know. Okay. So I'm going to do, just for, just for convenience uh, for us here tonight, I'm going to do something that I would never do normally, which is I'm going to just add my testing stuff to the same class library that I've already got. Normally, of course, in that sharp like in any other language, you would put your code under test in a project all by itself, and then you create a separate project with all your testing code in it, and then you would reference the former into the latter, and then 
But I'm just going to be lazy and cheat. And I'm going to go into NuGet. And I'm going to look for FS unit. We're trying to short the sign here. I'm just going to jump into FS unit. Assuming it can find this. Okay. Now, originally there was just one FS unit. Now there are lots of different flavors of FS unit. FS unit is an add-on to your favorite existing uh, fill-in-the-blank unit testing framework. So originally it was for N unit, and that if you just dial up the vanilla FS unit uh, package, you'll You'll get it. Uh, you'll get end unit included with it. Um, but it also works with X unit, MB unit, and MBC unit. Okay. Um, the MBC support is the latest it added, and it only works in Visual Studio 11. So if you're still on 2010, uh, you can't use that. But uh, the others work work with 2010, and they all work in 2011. I happen to like the one for X unit. Has anybody here ever done unit testing with X unit? Anybody? Not here. Other than, other than. <laughs> Okay, X unit. Uh, I'm going to use the X unit version, and I'll tell you why as it's installing. Um, it's because X unit is the simplest, sparest, no BS unit testing framework out there. Um, the guys who designed XUnit said, we're going to create a new unit testing framework because we think the others are too complicated. And they have too much stuff in them that nobody uses. And we're going to strip things down to the essential. Okay? So that's, uh, that's how they came up with XUnit. One reason that I like it is because XUnit, unlike all the others, doesn't make you declare a class. Okay. There is no such thing as a test fixture in X unit as there is in N unit and all the others. All right. And that lends itself very nicely to F sharp because then I can just write my test as plain old functions and decorate them with the fact attribute, which is X unit's uh, way of marking a function as a test, and it'll and the test engine will run it, and I don't have to have a class going on. So it's very easy and natural to do. So I'm going to add a new um, a new item with a new FSHARP source file called unit tests. Well, unit tests to my private. Okay. And it creates an F sharp module. Now an F sharp module actually under the under the covers is very much like a visual basic.net module. Anybody know what anybody do visual basic.net in it? Nobody wants to admit it. Um, visual basic uh, continuing its heritage from old fashioned visual basic has something in it called a module. And a module is really just a static class. That's what it turns into in the runtime. So you can think of, it, think of this as creating a static class called unit test. And the function that I'm going to write on here is going to be a member of that static class. But I don't have to go through all the ritual of creating the class and doing all that number X stuff that I was showing earlier. We just write functions. Um, before I write my functions, I think I want to open some, um, uh, some of these uh, other libraries that I'm referencing now. So I'm referencing a library called XUnit. You give it open. Okay. Um, we're going to capitalize it. Well, oh, okay. Hello. No. Uh, 
Thank you for noticing that. Okay, so we're going to open X unit and then we're going to open uh, FX unit. So, okay, so that. And then we'll open up FX unit. Notice I did get some IntelliSense there. Uh, IntelliSense support in F-Sharp is better in each version of Visual Studio, but it's still not quite as good as it is in C-Sharp. Uh, and I blame that on the fact that Visual Studio itself is a god-awful platform to write anything for. And IntelliSense is, is you know, you gotta get better Visual Studio. Uh, Alright, let's try writing a test. Let's, let's do this. You know my test is going to be tick tick. Um, true is not false. Okay, now you look at this and saying, "What the heck?" Um, this is not what you're used to calling a function. You know, a function. This is a nice little syntactic feature of F sharp. It allows you to name things with just about any string of characters you can come up with at any length. As long as you enclose that series of characters inside two tick marks. Now the tick mark is on your keyboard in the upper left hand corner right below, on mine it's right below the escape key, right to the left of the number one, right underneath the tilde. Okay, uh, there's a fighting chance that a lot of you in this room have never pressed that key in your life. At least never on purpose. And probably don't know what it's called. It's called the tick. At least that's what the F sharp people chose to call it. Alright? It is easily confused with the single quotation mark. But as you can see, if you look at it closely, it's not a single quotation mark because it's slanted a little bit from left to right. Okay? If you see it slanted like that, instead of going straight up and down, then you know it's a tick mark. And of course, if you see something like true is not false as the name of something inside of it, then it must be a tick mark. Alright? So I can get, I can use this as the name of a function. Actually, I can use this as the name of just about anything I want. But it's particularly nice to use it as the name of a function for testing. Why? Because one of the reasons we write tests is to document what our code is for. And if we can give our tests names like this, then it's pretty darn easy just reading it to see what it is that this test is proving about our code. Okay? It's common in other unit testing frameworks, uh, other, other unit testers writing in other languages that don't have this wonderful tick convention, to write names for tests with underscores in them that go on quite verbosely. Okay? And here you can be just as verbose without those underscores. And uh, it's even more readable. Okay? So, I'm now going to create a, uh, uh, the actual body of my test. And I'm going to attempt to write it correctly. No, let's, 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 let's do the let's do the, the, the honest thing here. And, uh, maybe fail first. Okay. So there's a test that's going to fail. I think so. Let's uh, make it give it the testing attributes so that the test runner in Visual Studio will actually run it. Okay. And, in most testing frameworks, the attribute you have to put on is called test. Here it's called fact. Okay, because uh, they just wrote, wrote this library, uh, actually, I don't know what library, uh, they, they like the term fact. 
a fact. All right, now that I've got a fact in my test, I will attempt to run a test. So let's go to run all tests. Now I have the Visual Studio Power Pack or whatever it's called in here. So I've got, this is not necessarily the same testing window that you have in your Visual Studio. Oh, and I have an X-Unit add-in, too. And this thing is kind of poked. Let's put the files up. There it is. Okay, so true is not false. It's the name of my test, and it failed. Now, I get a little mixed up with parentheses when I start writing this. So. Okay, so before I start, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time explaining the syntax here, but before I do, again, this is set up, this whole thing has been set up very deliberately to make the test easy to read. So the idea is Mr. Customer, or Ms. Customer, or Ms. I don't know F sharp, can pick this up and look at it and guess at least correctly a good 90 to 95 percent of the time what the test does. Okay? And the test says this value here should not equal this. Okay? Now what's interesting is that true of course is the value true. Right, that's a constant. I'll put that on the left hand side and uh, well, you can see on the screen that it's in blue. Color coding going on there. All right, so the constant value true. This is called the pipe forward operator. This takes whatever's to the left of it and feeds it in as an argument to whatever's to the right. So whatever's to the right needs to be a function. Hence the word should. Should is actually the name of a function. Okay. Equal is also uh, okay. So then, what, what's going on here under under you know behind all the syntactic sugar is that a whole series of functions are being strung together. Should is the first, is the main one. This next one, not, is another function name that's going to uh, take whatever comes after it and, and negate it. And then equal is a function. And it's taking false as its argument. Okay. Um, to explain more fully what this is doing, we need to look at the source code, which I have over here, but it's it's late, and I'm not going to probably be able to make a whole lot of sense out of it for you. But trust me, if you download the source code and you go in and look at the definitions um, for all this stuff, you will see that each of these things in the syntax is actually, these are not keywords in the language, but they look like they might be keywords in the language, but what they really are are names of functions. Okay? All right, so applying this to my, uh, my, uh, my other project, well, all right, so let's, Let's open, uh, let's open library, oh no, let's, no, let's open unit tests. So unit tests is the name of the module that I wrote my code in. Alright, so now let's do some testing in, on unit tests. Um, you know what? This is a terrible name. Let me change this is from, um, let me change the name of this library to expression library. Okay. And 
So that means I'm going to change it over here as well. Alright, so let's write us a test. Um, for that library. And we'll say that uh, constant uh, 2 evaluates to 2. And what that's going to say is 2 Fight forward operator should equal now class two. Okay, control R A. That we know. Okay, now, I'm not being test driven here, strictly speaking, to an agile purist because I wrote this code first, and now I'm testing it. So I'm coming up with my test after the fact, and of course the test passed because I already wrote the code, but I already tested it in the interactive window. So this is, if I tested in the interactive window, I could just say, all right, it's tested, and I could go on with life, but I haven't left any documented record behind of what testing I did, and I haven't left any documented record of what the purpose was for the code when I wrote it. Okay? So even though I might have tested it initially in the interactive window, I can still go in here and create some unit tests and let that serve as a better, as a more permanent way of reporting what testing I did. And then of course also, as I go in and change this thing going forward, I can run all these tests again and I can see if I broke it. Okay. All right, so that's that's the quick 7.30 in the evening time to move on view of, um, of uh, using FS unit. Now, one other thing to say is that all this syntactic uh, shortcutting that I'm doing here is, is great for readability. It's great for helping you sort of think in terms of the functionality that you're trying to test. But you don't have to use it. If you wanted to just import uh, from NuGet and import the X unit library itself without the FS unit on top, and then write assert statements um, instead of you know call the call the assert method in, in, in the X unit library, which is what all this is doing all the way the hood, you can still do that. So if you, if you love writing unit tests with N unit or MD unit or any of those, and you like the syntax, and, and that's how you feel comfortable doing it, you can go right ahead and do it in F sharp, and, and you probably won't find the syntax of using the library. Okay? All right, I'm going to take time to look at one more thing um, carefully, and then uh, if we need to go, we can go. Uh, Right, I'm going I'm to now create a project with uh, with uh, Fixpec. Okay. So I'm going to uh, create me another library. Okay. Now we're going to forget about all that stuff I already did. Because TickSpec, when you get it from NuGet, comes with some nice sample code. At least it did the last time I tried it. Right. TickSpec also comes in several flavors. All right. You can get the, the original flavor, um, you know, um, which I believe is within unit. There's no dependency. Yeah. There's the original tick spec, there's tick spec with N unit, tick spec with X unit, tick spec for Silverlight. Um, I'll try X unit again. Because I like X unit. Okay. Now, 
when you when you uh, when you download and, and install the new get package to fix back, it throws in some sample code for you, so you can get the hang of what of what it is, how it works, and what you're doing. Uh, the first thing to look at is the very last file that comes with it, which is called stockfeature.txt. And this is what you this is what fixback is supposed to allow you to do. Instead of writing your tests in code, you write your text in te tests in a text file with a txt extension. And this is not executable code. This is just text. And it's written in this special stylized language, which is called Gherkin. How many of you have heard of Gherkin? Okay, so what Gherkin is derived from a library that was originally developed for Ruby, used extensively in Ruby on Rails. Uh, I saw a Rails guy get a demo at the Codeman conference and he was using Cucumber, and he was just lying uh, with writing out little stories like this over and over again and building up testing it. Um, the idea is you want to write, you want to be able to write a little story. And again, if you, if you come from an agile methodology where stories are what you call requirements, okay, stories are scenarios, stories are the functionality that you're supposed to implement with your software. And the Gherkin, uh, Gherkin is sort of a, a, a convention, a conventional way of talking that says, um, I'm, I've got this scenario here. The name of the scenario is refunded items should be returned to stock. And then we can, here we go. We say, given a customer who buys a black jumper and I have three black jumpers left in stock, so those are said to be three conditions. When he returns the jumper, and those are he, not a she, uh, when he returns the jumper for a refund, then I should have four black jumpers in stock. Okay? So, I'm writing software that's supposed to be implementing a stock... Uh, 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 the guy who wrote this is a guy named Phil Crawford, and he's British. He works in the financial industry in London. Cambridge. So he has a little bit of British uh, tinge to this story. It's called jumpers instead of... Uh, and call it stock instead of input. Okay, but that aside, you can get the idea. So this is supposed to be an executable test. Let's see if it is. Um, test run, all test. Built anyway. And here we go. This is his test, the stock feature test, and then it ran and it passed. Okay, so where is the test? Well, the test is the test is going to be built out of this narrative that he wrote in his text box. Using some components that were written that sharp. First we have a file called the definitions file. Okay, and here is a type, um, an F sharp type to represent an item in stock. And you can see it has only one member to it, which is an integer called count. All right, then he's creating a mutable variable. So this time we actually have a variable, okay, called stock item. He's created an instance of his stock item class and he's made it mutable and he's given it an initial value of zero. Not in stock. Okay. Then he starts defining expressions here and he uses this syntax of um, a string of text inside a couple of ticks. And this needs to be a verbatim quote that can appear somewhere inside of his story. So here are the words, the customer buys a black jumper. And 
that appears inside the given part of a Gherkin statement. So that's this, the given. All right, so this says when we're reading the given part, the given section, and we encounter this verbiage right here, then do this, which is nothing. Okay? Continuing through the given part, if we come to this verbiage, it says I have, and then a special little uh, shortcut convention here, friends dot star, black jumpers <laughs> left in stock, and then these are tick marks, so we can mark this out how we want. Alright, then after that, you see uh, a, ver a, a parameter being defined called n and it's type in. When that happens, then assign to the stock item with this destructive assignment operator a new stock item that has count equal to n. Okay? So, this is extracting from the string here, this is a function that takes this input, extracts from it an integer, and uses that integer in this function body line right here to replace the stock item with a new one that's got a new count. Okay? Likewise, if he returns the jumper for a refund, then we do this. We replace the stock item again, this time with count incremented by one. And finally, oh, and this is this was in the when part of the part of the Story. And finally, in the then part, I could have x black, you know, uh, dot star black jumpers in stock, and we assert that we are equal to the stock item count. Okay, so the point is, this is all talking about stock items. This is talking about a mutable uh, instance of a stock item. This is talking about functions that mutate that mutable instance of the stock item. But we could make these functions do anything we want. Okay, all we have to do is, is decide that this particular kind of verbiage appearing in this part of a, of a Gherkin story is going to have this meaning. And then uh, when the, uh, uh, when the uh, test is evaluated, it's going to pick up that file, read it, look for verbiage like this, and build tests out. Okay, and the magic where that happens is in the final, in the one more F sharp file up here. Now this is too much code for me to go through at this time of night, but the key part of it is down here. Um, we're going to, you see here he's got the name of his uh, text file being opened by a regular .NET file object. Okay, so it's opening up a file screen, and it's feeding that file screen into a object called definitions. That's what's going to build the tests that will then be turned over and run. Okay, now it's a very instructive uh, uh, F sharp exercise to read through all the source code for how this works. Okay, because this. Uh, and I'm not going to take time to do it right now. It's a little advanced, but it's not as it, it's actually easier to understand than the FS unit source code is. So it's kind of interesting to read through this and see how it's actually done. But the upshot is, you as a tester, once this is all in place, all you have to do is write little uh, methods like this, which are simply all they really are doing is. is uh, opening up a file, so as many files as you have that you want, and you can obviously automate this a little more by just saying open up all the files you locate in a folder, and uh, you know, and, and, and one test on one by one. Okay, so you can you, know, you can create multiple methods down here to uh, to uh, one for each file, or have one that opens multiple files, and then. In this here, you you know, using this rather simple syntax, define what it means when each piece of verbiage occurs in one of the testing files. Okay? 
This is exactly the same procedure that, that SpecFlow used. If anyone here did use SpecFlow and C sharp or D. Same idea. Okay. Uh, with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna lay off because uh, the last library I was gonna talk about is FOQ folks for mocking. Um, basically, if you've used mock before uh, in C sharp, folk does what mock does in F sharp. Um, mocking is much less uh, important in testing if you are testing purely functional code because mocking is supposed to simulate mutable objects. Typically, the reason you need a mock object is because uh, something needs to change. Some object somewhere needs to change its internal state. And if the internal state represents data in a database or files in a file system or users in an active directory and we don't want to tamper with real data, uh, we create mock objects instead to simulate uh, the real objects that we're going to use at runtime. And a mocking framework is simply a library that you create these things on the fly um, in your testing code rather than having to pull them out of the pre existing assembly okay. All right, so I tried to sort of give you a, give you a, little, a little bit of background about F sharp, try to show you some specifics about, about things you can do with F sharp and how F sharp works. It's not going to be a substitute for, for learning it hands-on. Um, the last thing I want to show you before we uh, put up here are the final piece of my slides. Fine. Make sure everybody sees this. Okay, more F sharp resources. You can learn an awful lot about F sharp online now. Um, People within Microsoft, people outside of Microsoft have been putting a lot of time and effort into making it feasible for people of all walks of life to learn F sharp. You do not have to live in New York or London. You do not have to work for an investment banking firm uh, or, or Stanford or MIT. You can sit down in front of your own computer and you can learn an awful lot about F sharp just by going to these websites. Um, the F Sharp Software Foundation is a website that just started about less than a month ago. And it's entirely volunteer. They're running it out of London. Uh, that Phil Trollford guy who wrote the uh, Tixpec library, also wrote the, uh, the Folk library, uh, he is one of the people participating in the F Sharp Foundation project. Okay. Um, great, great hub for finding resources about F Sharp. Uh, Try F Sharp is an online repo. Okay, it's, a, it's an interactive window that runs in JavaScript right in the browser. I've got IE 10 or Chrome or some you know, reasonably up to date browser. You can, and it, it runs you through a series of tutorials that start at a very, very total beginner level and get into fairly sophisticated level if you want to go that far. Um, it doesn't do anything that you can't do yourself with Visual Studio. But it holds your hand like crazy. So if you need needling and cajoling and, and, and go to the try on as you're going, uh, try F sharp is a terrific resource. And lastly, F sharp snippets. That's sort of a wiki for code snippets. And anybody can contribute code snippets to it. I have several uh, of my own on there that I don't think are especially brilliant, but if you're ever wondering how would I do that in F sharp, or has anybody in F sharp ever tried this, uh, you can go there, and uh, it doesn't have the greatest search capability, but it has uh, it has some. And you can also just browse around and look for stuff, and, and just see what you can find there. Most of the code snippets are very short, and they tend to be very well written, even though it's really not monitored. Uh, so I. I, I, I've learned a lot just by contributing to that or, or, or pointing things down to other people to do it. And last but not least, this is kind of the F sharp set. It's going to keep meeting. And uh, uh, my colleague Mike is like, hoping it. So up next time, there's a very good thing for us, but I'll be here. Um, and uh, I'd like to keep this going. So go out and, and, and 
play with F sharp, uh, suffer with F sharp. Uh, and, oh, and, and my email is on the slide too. If you want to get touch with me, if you have any questions or comments to make, uh, here I am, arboreto at jennyedelson.com, and you can tweet me at Surya. Okay? All right. Thank you. So much. Thank you. And, uh, maybe this, oh, maybe this video will be on. Sleep therapy. All right. How do we turn this off? I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm taking the